but they really just want you to be present with them and enjoy. If you got a phone, camera, iPad, launch that thing in the river. They have an amazing photo and video team are gonna capture everything. They just want you to enjoy this. Today we're talking all about video. So we're not doing hybrid, we're not doing both photo and video. We're only doing video at today's wedding. We're gonna go behind the scenes to all the different segments of the day. It is a full wedding day and we're doing a highlight film. If you are interested in going a little bit more in depth and actually seeing my editing process and how I use music, where I select music from, how we capture audio and everything else that goes into a wedding film, this is just gonna be the shooting today. Head on over to the members website because until my birthday, which is July 14th, you can actually get in for $30 a month rather than $40 a month. And if you are not happy, it's a 30 day money back guarantee. So you join, it just wasn't what you were expecting. Send me an email and I will send you your money back. First, let's talk about gear. Everyone's favorite topic. There's also uh, topics at the bottom here if you wanna skip around and you wanna just go straight to the behind the scenes, that's fine, I won't be offended. Right here I have my Canon R3. Canon R3 is not a requirement to do wedding video. Uh, the reason that I use it is because of the hybrid nature of my business that I am typically mostly a wedding photographer and also doing a highlight video on the side. This makes it a very one button solution. I can, when I'm in photo mode, I can just hit this and go into full manual settings. Uh, it's a very, very nice camera to use. It's the autofocus is amazing. And also the IBIS, the stabilization, especially when stacked with a lens like this, it's really just a very easy camera to use and to handhold. We're not gonna be using any tripods, any monopods in this video. On the front of this Canon R3 is my 70 to 200 f2.8. This was a lens that I was not going to get for this year. I was convinced that I could just get by my 85. For a wedding video, I find it so helpful to have a 70 to 200 zoom. Typically, you are the person that's kind of getting the candid coverage, maybe over the shoulder of a photographer or you're zooming around people. Having a 70 to 200 makes framing so much easier. So I do recommend that as maybe even a main lens, depending on your style. We call the 85 and I guess the 70 to 200 is kind of the introvert lens that if you want to be a little bit further away but still get into the action, uh, those are the lenses to go with. And the 70 to 200 Canon, as you can see, it's very, very small and light. Uh, the new one, it is unfortunately a little bit expensive. Next up. We have a lens that is very difficult to find now, the Samyang 85 millimeter f1.4. The it works, autofocus works great with the, the Canon RF series, and I really, really love that look shooting at 1.4. It's also, when you go into a getting ready situation, it's a little less intimidating, maybe not that much, but it's a little smaller and people don't really pay as much attention to you. And I really love the look and feel. You're gonna see a lot of examples from this, uh, from specifically the getting ready section of the day. And I really love this lens a lot and I do wish that I could shoot with it all day, but sometimes it's just not possible. Next up, we got the little 50. It's the, the nifty 50. Very inexpensive. If you are somebody that likes the 50 millimeter focal length, maybe that's an option for you. I prefer the 85 and I would spend the entire day on this with my the Canon R6 that we're recording this on and the 35 millimeter F 1.8 on my second camera body. Shoot two camera bodies similar to how I would do a day of photography. And I have that either on my shoulder for the ceremony or maybe in my bag if it's getting ready and I can always just go to it. That said, I can usually make most things work with just the 85, but you'll find often shooting with a prime is that it kind of puts you in a box and you have to do something creative within that box. So your frames are maybe a little bit different than what you would have come in and done had you had a wider lens. So uh, again, this is what I use. Take from it what you will. This video is kind of all about taking the bits and pieces that make sense for you and your specific business and applying them and, and running forward and creating something that is your own rather than just trying to emulate exactly what I'm doing. Now into the most controversial topic that you're gonna see in this video, ND filters. What an ND filter is, it lets less light to the lens, as you can see there. Theoretically, if you talk to any cinematographers, they're gonna tell you you have to be at the 180 shutter rule. And what that means, I'm shooting 30 frames per second right now on this, I know, 30 frames a second, wow. Uh, I'm shooting 30p on this camera right now, which means my shutter speed, which it is, should be one slash 60th of a second. If I move my hand like this, there's a nice natural blur and your eye is used to seeing that. It's very pleasing, very calming. If I was to say, bump my ISO up and bring my shutter speed up. So I'm now at one slash 1600 of shutter. Now all of a sudden, just looks a little, a little choppier. So how you fix that is if it gets bright, you put that on your camera and all of a sudden, the world is a little bit darker. My problem is that I like to shoot wide open. We'll go back to F. 1.8 now, which is the pleasing look that I like. And the problem for me as a hybrid shooter is that I have to be bouncing between settings from photography to video, and it really just isn't sustainable. You're gonna miss moments, or you're gonna get those moments a few seconds after they actually happened, which is not ideal. I would rather get the moments, and maybe if they're technically not as great, I'll be okay with that. Today in the example you're going to see, I ran an ND all day, and I shot it properly and correctly. And I will be completely honest, 
it feels no different. The final project does not feel different to me than had I just shot it like a regular hybrid video and shot at one slash four thousandth of a second and added something called Real Smart Motion Blur. If you're seeing a clip and it's really jittery, like my hand waving and the high shutter speed there, you can apply a plugin and that plugin will basically add or mimic kind of that natural motion blur. And I would say every wedding, if I'm shooting hybrid with no ND, I maybe add it to one or two shots every other wedding. So it's not something that happens all the time and it's not something that I absolutely require, but it does help smooth out some of those shots if you are doing a panning shot. Now, if you are going to be on something like a gimbal and you're gonna be doing push-ins and, and all kinds of crazy camera moves and panning with people and you're gonna have a lot of action going on in your scene, maybe one of these would be required. I would recommend checking out a dedicated video about ND filters if you are interested because there's a lot of different ones. Some of them are fixed, some of them are variable. Uh, there's a little bit to learn. It's also very confusing, so if you're sitting there and you're like, man, I'm gonna turn this video off, this is so overwhelming. Just don't worry about it. This section just doesn't exist for you and you'll, you're gonna be fine. For my camera settings, now that I have this Canon R3, I actually shoot everything at 4K 60, so 60p, 60 frames a second, which means that I can slow everything down to nice slow motion in post-production. Again, if this is not your taste, don't be like, I have to make a slow motion highlight film. What I do is pretty much just a slow motion music video. This is kind of born from the hybrid coverage that I do, that I'm doing both photography and video, and to do a full day and to get people to read letters, it really just didn't kind of fit into either what I wanted or what my couples wanted, so I do very much music video style thing, and I found that a lot of my couples, they don't necessarily want to have their voice. Some of them have actively told me that they do not want to hear their voice on the recording, so they don't want, like, even if you were to go bonus above and beyond and be like, I put your vows in a beautiful cut during the interlude in the song, they'd be like, can you get rid of it? I hate listening to myself talk, and it pulls me out of the story. But again, that is kind of what my couples, uh, I, I would suspect that like attracts like, so a more introverted person is going to attract more introverted couples. Uh, so if you're a more extroverted personality and you love getting up on stage and, and talking, and your couples do too, uh, maybe it makes sense for you to include more audio. Uh, there's, in the, the courses that you can get if you're part of the members website, I walk through all of my audio capture process and how I do that in the field. Beyond that, I'm shooting manual settings and I'm typically on cloud or shade white balance. I like a warmer skin tone. Typically, my couples, uh, even if we're out in the hot sun, I'm usually having them face away from the sun so that the sun is at their back and they're backlit, which means their face is in the shade. So if I'm on shade white balance, I'm exposing properly for the white balance kind of on their face. Pretty simple. As you can see, I like to keep things as simple and as minimal as possible. So let's head on to the behind the scenes wedding day. Here we are, wedding day. And uh, the video clip I'm taking is gonna be in the bottom left throughout these videos. And as you can see, I have the ND on and it's giving a little bit of a ghost effect there. So adding an additional piece of glass, I don't know, kinda just obscures your optical quality a little bit more. And typically I would say the correct way to do cinematography is to set up your shot. When the shot is ready to go, hit record. Unfortunately, that doesn't really play out too well in weddings, especially when you're doing hybrid photo video coverage. So I've left all the raw clips in and you'll see that I launch and start recording before I've even properly exposed my shot. And that's just kind of the way that I've been doing it for years. And it's easy enough to kind of pick the selection out of the shot that you need, but it is pretty dirty coverage <laughs> overall. And then it's shot at 60p, so it'll slow down and you get basically more time out of each individual clip uh, that way than if you were just shooting everything in real time. Again, something I kind of, uh, I guess, had to rely on when doing hybrid photo video coverage, but I found that it just feels very, very nice. And another thing, I guess, is that coming from a hybrid photo video background, you uh, you really don't have a chance to overshoot. And today I very much feel like I overshot this wedding uh, for the first time in a very, very long time. I'm shooting everything on my Samyang 85 millimeter F 1.4, which does not have stabilization. I do have to be a little bit more careful with this. Uh, my 35 millimeter lens that I usually use for detail shots, it has IS on it. So that IS stacks nicely and works together with the camera body. So use a 35, 35, usually the focus distance on it is a little bit closer. And this is kind of all across brands, just the physics of a 35 allow you to focus a little bit closer. So even if it's not exactly a macro lens, it's pretty close. And this is just me again, kind of shooting through everything and just getting all the clips that I need. And just, uh, you'll see if you do sign up to the member site and go through the editing, that I'm just setting in and out points and just pulling small clips and it's a very, very fast process. Typically, if I'm doing a highlight video, uh, I can pretty much have that edited and final within about an hour. 
I would say, if I'm fully working on that alone and I'm not being distracted. And that is because I've pre-selected my music and I just drop that on the timeline and my process is that I do a full rough cut first, which usually brings, I would say I shoot about 25 minutes of total footage once it's slowed down uh, for when I'm doing hybrid. Today, I, I'll do the math uh, eventually here, but I think I probably shot maybe about an hour of footage total, which is significantly more than I ever would otherwise. Um, I also feel like I don't really need it, and you'll see that I just kind of overshoot because I, I'm there to do video today, and also when I'm not with Lindsay, I will be doing some photography, but there was a little bit of an element of looking busy and also maybe catching a couple shots that I wouldn't have caught otherwise. But for a regular hybrid day, I will not shoot this much. Also, sorry for the no ambient audio. We were playing music and it'll just get triggered by uh, YouTube copyright and weird things will happen. So I'm just going to leave. It'll just, it'll just be us here right now. And again, rolling on the clip before I am entirely ready to go. And the very Belendi that I'm using is the Peter McKinnon Mist plus very Belendi. It's a two to five stop. And in some cases, I'm, I'm fairly certain I stayed pretty much at proper 180 rule. Uh, you can kind of creep on my settings on the top of the LCD whenever there's not a video clip recording. When there is a video clip recording, it actually just shows that it's recording and doesn't actually show you settings. But I use that and I think it was maxed out pretty much at five stops all day. Uh, so I probably could use, I think it's a five to nine stop that is the other one or a six to nine stop. Uh, I probably could have went with that since I shoot very wide open. My wide open on this Sam Yang 85 is 1.4. My process for doing video is that I would let the photographer do whatever the photographer needs to do. And the only time I would step in is if there's, uh, if say for instance, we're, we're doing a group shot and all of, say in this case, the guys getting ready, the guys are all together, arm around each other and they're smiling and facing the camera. And if I know that the photographer is going to call that the shot and they're going to just kind of call the scene there, I'll either ask them if they can kind of have them all look at each other and laugh or I'll just kind of cue it myself. I don't like to overstep. And by that, I mean just taking over a scene and really making them do a lot of things for video. Uh, I don't, I don't want to be calling action on scenes and making them do specific things. Again, that's maybe not the right or wrong way to do a wedding day. It's kind of whatever you like the best. For me, I like the candid nature of this rather than setting up shots and doing like a gimbal follow of him leaving this uh, Airbnb and, and shots like that, that I could do technically, uh, but also that would set the precedent that if I did a very nice follow shot in the open, I would have to continue with that style of coverage throughout the wedding day, whereas I feel like this is a little bit more versatile. Uh, I'm also not using a monopod, I'm not using a tripod. If I'm doing full ceremony coverage, I will use a tripod um, or a monopod, I guess, as well. Um, Tim likes to live dangerously and he has the, the one with legs and he just puts a camera on it and it just stands there as a monopod without him near it. I'm not that confident in my equipment. Uh, I like to have second cameras on a tripod and typically the way that I will run multi-cam coverage is uh, that on the contract I will tell them that it is a single shot with audio so they're not expecting a big production like a, a Hollywood scene and also to guide expectations that a, a, a full ceremony isn't going to look like every movie that they've seen that to do that in one take in one shot in live real time is pretty much impossible especially as a smaller team if, you, if I had five shooters there six shooters there maybe we could get something pretty close but as a one-person team and again going back to the fact that my couples usually want somebody that's a little bit like them I would not want a team of 18 people at my wedding day to do video um, also I'm just waiting for his feet to naturally walk somewhere as a transition shot there we go we got it Sorry that that was a bit weird and I didn't explain why that was happening. Uh, I do that a lot where I just, I know that something's going to happen and I just kind of wait for it. As a video person, you kind of have to have those transition shots. And if you, uh, you can kind of do some pickup shots or you can, you can kind of fake transition shots that if, say for instance, I didn't have one and I had a venue exterior or even if I had some foliage or something, I could use that as a little bit of a bridge, but it's a bit weird to just slam cut from guys prep to girls prep unless you have something to link it together, uh, which in this case is actually their vows books. Uh, they have books of vows and you can kind of go one for one shot. So Tyler, my editor, actually uh, found that and basically it's the, the cut is on his vows and then it cuts to her vows in a similar shot. So uh, shout out to Tyler for, for finding that. 
And also for putting together the, the bones of this behind the scenes. I just came in for the voiceover and the intro and outro. Also, wedding video doesn't really look that great without music. You really need music and the this, this story to involve you before it really starts to be what it is. So framing out that crane on the left, the nemesis of my existence here at this venue. And the girls are at an Airbnb that is across the street here. And lots of good natural light, which is awesome. Uh, the one of the, like, for photography, it's rough whenever you get into a room and it's dark and there's only pot lights. For video, it's even more challenging if you are getting really bad light. I will say that video is a little bit more forgiving, maybe, that when you walk into, say, for instance, with direct sunlight, I would never really shoot direct sun with photography, but with video, it becomes a little bit more reasonable when you see people moving and interactions happening. You're able to forgive the bad lighting a little bit. I don't want to ever have to shoot in that, but if I have to, it is a little bit easier overall, um, I guess, to accept in video. Also, this is pretty much all real time. I left in most of uh, what we did today and just, I wanted to show you all the shots that I get. I am by no means the most skilled wedding video creator in the entire history of the world, but hopefully to show you some of my process will unlock a little bit of clarity for you and it'll make your life a little bit easier or maybe it'll just immediately be like wow i'm way better than this guy and this guy's making a video on youtube I i'm fine i'll just i'll just go to the wedding i don't need to watch any more content and you'll see that i am a little bit bumpy and the reason for that is actually because i drank a red bull on the way to the wedding and I can smooth this all out with warp stabilize very easily if you're shooting 4K60. It gives you more than enough to work with. Even 1080 60, um, you can warp stabilize and, and make it exactly uh, a stable shot. But uh, for me, if I actually have Red Bull or something prior to going to the event, I actually do feel like a little bit shaky for the first little bit. And you'll notice that it calms down. But then at some point, my optical stabilization goes off of my 7200. And I, I, don't, I don't know how long I didn't notice it for, but it was at some point during or after the ceremony, and I noticed it uh, a little bit just before the reception. So things get a little bouncy, but you can fix it in post-production. Again, kind of just shooting around what Lindsay's kind of set up here. I don't feel too bad stealing setups from Lindsay because she's my wife, and I think that there's an understanding there, especially when doing video. Like, there's no reason to reset up everything that... I feel like photo and video kind of work together that if they remember something in their photo and the video complements that, I feel like that's that's fine. It would be quite weird to if, say, Lindsay set the dress up and I went and did the dress video shot and then I was like, you know what, I'm going to bring it outside and I'm going to do a completely different look and feel from their photography experience. I feel like, I don't know, it's it's a better, I think, to go with, with the photography and what they memorize, what they remember from the day and to not fight against that too hard. Maybe that makes sense, maybe that doesn't make sense. Here we are, still at 1 slash 125th shutter speed. Incredible. Out here, I had to bring my aperture down, I maxed out my ND, so I'm at f2, which is very unlike me. I'd want to be at f1.4, but unfortunately, in order to maintain that shutter speed, ISO is minimum. Aperture, it's gotta, gotta go smaller. Bigger number. Smaller aperture, physically kind of like a golf game that aperture whether it's smaller or bigger again for just getting candid coverage I enjoy this style of content uh, as far as the wedding video goes I shoot a lot heavier also knowing depending on timeline so today we have lots of time we have lots of events but if we are say for instance the wedding that I did yesterday we were in a very compressed four-hour timeline where there was no wedding party a the couple and their kids only and then at the reception only the couple ended up doing a speech so there really was not a whole lot of content for the video so we had to shoot pretty heavy on all of the other things in order to make a proper highlight film and to not stretch a minute and 20 seconds into a three or four minute highlight for them uh, so I really do kind of roll on more in between moments and more transition shots that probably aren't going to make great photos like that her coming down the stairs there probably not a great photo but for video for something moving within the shot it kind of makes it worth actually seeing and speaking from a hybrid photo video standpoint it probably makes the most sense if you are somebody that's interested in getting into hybrid photo video is to start small so start aim for a 30 second instagram highlight first you're doing photography coverage surprise them with a little small video 
and go from there. Don't try to do a three minute highlight and also photography coverage right off the start. You're going to stress yourself out. You're not going to deliver the product that you want on either side and it's going to be a letdown for your couple. Uh, so start small, create a good body of work of these smaller highlights for your couples that you're there. Uh, and also make verify that they don't have a, a wedding video team uh, hired because if you're shooting a video and they're shooting a video, it's very awkward. So don't ever do that, but shoot some video clips when you're at a wedding that they don't have someone there doing video and start building that catalog of content. So whenever you do announce that you are doing wedding films, that it's not just one wedding film as a sample that you can do a minute highlight of a bunch of different weddings that you've shot uh, to show that you're, that you've worked in different environments. You haven't only shot in the perfect shade under like a beautiful tent that you have worked in harder conditions. You'll also notice that my white balance is warmer in my Canon camera than it is on the GoPro. And that is because life looks better in a sunset. <laughs> I'm kidding. Well, I'm not kidding. It does look better. Uh, I typically shoot. So this is the straight out of camera footage you're seeing. And then I will actually grade it with the LUT uh, that you have access to if you're a member. And the LUT is I believe 2020 clean or 2021 clean. Um, it is the clean preset that I use for everything. Sometimes I will switch it to my main preset in incandescent situations. So typically on photography, I use my main preset for everything and then I use clean maybe every now and then, but for video, I use clean as my main preset and main as my kind of secondary preset of lighting is just not agreeing with skin tones or usually it's a venue thing and I walk into a venue and I'm like, wow, there's no way that this preset's gonna work in here and I can know before I even really get into editing uh, what's gonna work the best. One thing that you have to reframe your mind as a photographer, I would get kind of two shots. I would get a shot of her maybe reacting, I would get maybe a full length or I would get maybe a shot over the shoulder just of the card. When it comes to video, you need a variety of different shots. You can do reveals from behind doors like this. And really, I guess one of the things that's going to save you a lot in a situation like this, this is a pretty clean Airbnb, fortunately, but a lot of the time, if you are in say a hotel room and there are seven people getting ready and there are seven people's things all around, if you can shoot it at F 1.4, you are going to save yourself so much struggle to actually frame a shot or to run around the room and actually clean things up. 85 also tends to keep a floor out of most of your shots as well. So while maybe you're a little bit tighter than you maybe would desire if you had a seven or a 24 to 70 that maybe you would have shot everything at 35 rather than at 85 or 70. But shooting at that longer focal length, I feel like cleans up your work and simplifies it and just gets all the garbage out of the back of the shot too. But no garbage today. So that is very, very nice. And if you could hear the ambient audio, you would hear that I'm not saying a whole lot, that I am very, very much fly on the wall, and I very much love doing this style of coverage, that this is kind of my happy place that I get to go in, I get to, to do some things, I don't have to direct anything, I can just sit back and uh, just live my life. That is kind of my most ideal. Uh, I think Sam Hurd also said that his dream goal is to second shoot for himself, that if he could just be the second shooter at his own weddings, that that would be kind of a dream. And I feel like you get, kind of get to live that whenever you're actually a video, their fly flew by there, it looked like a bird, um, that you actually get to kind of live that lifestyle when you are the video person. So it's nice as a mix as well. So I do a lot of weddings. I used to do about 60, 70 weddings every single year as photography and you know, most of them video coverage. It's very nice to have the ability to switch it up as well that today doing video, I have maybe two other, three other video bookings this year. And other than that, I'm doing some hybrid days, some photography only days. And in order to keep yourself fresh and not burnt out, it's actually kind of nice to, to know you're going in that, hey, today I'm only doing four hours of photo coverage. That's a relaxing day. Or today I'm going in, I'm making only a highlight film. That's a fun day. That's not what I usually do. Uh, so I feel like by learning video, you actually get to... Uh, bring a little bit more joy into your work if you are feeling kind of burnt out, maybe August, September time. And if you are a wedding photographer, uh, maybe one thing I would recommend, if you are interested in getting into video, you probably know a wedding photographer. They probably have a wedding booked on a date that you're not booked for. And there's a pretty good chance that maybe they don't have a, a video couple or a video team hired to, to come to the wedding day. And if it's a couple of weeks away, you're probably not going to step on any toes if you decide to just come in and be the nice person to just offer them a video in order to build your portfolio. And maybe there's parameters within that, that if you're coming in to do a free video, you're obviously not going to do full coverage with ceremony and speeches and 
a 25 minute edit. Maybe you come in, you're like, I'll give you a three minute highlight set to music. I'll let you pick the song. Here's five songs to pick from. And again, over the courses, I'll talk a little bit more about songs and how to get things legally and that you don't get kicked off of whatever you try to post it on as well. So sign up for July 14th. Uh, otherwise it's still a great deal. It's still like probably the best deal in photography and well for wedding photography. I'm sure there's other things that I'm unaware of, but for wedding photography and for, I guess also maybe we can bridge this quickly too, that when you are creating video content, all of a sudden you unlock a lot of travel opportunities as well. Uh, I will speak to the fact that whenever we get hired to go to destination weddings, when, if it's just myself, maybe before Lindsay and I met that they would contact me and they were like, Hey, we're looking for a photographer. And as one person I could be like, and also I'll build you like a minute and a half, two minute highlight film as well. You are very, very instantly the couple's number one choice for the wedding day. And it, it, you're not even in competition with anyone else. Cause now you're one person that can do both. Uh, when it comes to doing travel projects and doing deals with hotels, as you probably know, all social media is kind of going in the direction of video, which means if you want to be able to create content for brands now, you kind of have to be good in doing video. So I think that there's no time like right now, this moment that you're watching to, to learn this. So if you are hesitant about like, oh, do I really want to spend the time to, to get good at this? I would 100% say that it is worth your time and effort. To get good at video, you already have the tools if you're a photographer, so just do it. Start now. It's fun. It teaches you more about photography, and it will legitimately change your life. Uh, I've actually started a second channel. You can go find my second channel. Search for Taylor Jackson, colon, second channel, the two dots, not the word colon. And uh, it's all about my YouTube education and things that would not really fit on this channel. This channel is all for photography, wedding photography, video, camera reviews. That channel is all for YouTube education. So far there are nine subscribers. So please come hang out and, uh, and learn some things and ask some questions. And I'm happy to tailor the content to be exactly what you want it to be, um, and what you'd like to learn. But I would say by learning video and by doing YouTube, it's made me, I guess doing YouTube makes me a better video creator because you get yourself in all kinds of weird situations that you have to make a video, or maybe you end up in a space that you would have never made a video before, or you meet somebody, a musician. One of the first videos I ever did was for a um, musician named Mateus that I met in New Zealand and I saw him playing piano and I sent him a message on Facebook and he got back to me and he was like, yeah, I'd love to do like a little promo video. So the next day, next evening I came out and he was basically a busker with a, a full stand up piano. And I captured some of the songs that he played and I captured his him talking about who he is and why he does the things that he does. And I put together a video. He obviously loved it. It obviously makes me a better uh, production person all across the board when it comes to capturing audio on location and doing video and doing everything. So uh, be excited about the world and get out there and, and capture what is interesting to you um, beyond just weddings. Didn't mean for this to turn into a TED talk. We're really just here to do the, the wedding video things. So here are the clips that we took once they're in slow motion. Again, ungraded, so you can grade them however you wish. I recommend Taylor Jackson Clean 2020 preset uh, LUT, I guess. And it is based off my preset for Lightroom. Uh, I just kind of converted them roughly over and I'm overall very, very happy with them. So as you can see, set to music, graded a little bit. Very, very lovely scene. People, they will be happy with your videos. Here we go, first look. First looks are always hard as a one person video team. They're hard enough as a photography team. This one, it went okay. It went 80%. There's kind of too much hot sun. Um, and I don't know why I cut there. That was a surprise decision. And also I tried to get the best I could, but it's, it's all right. In slow motion, it looks nice. In real time, it's a little harsh. I wish we had more space. It was really, really hot this day. We had very little shade. The shade was spotty. And again, overstepping, I don't want to just like set up the entire scene to be exactly what I want. I want to work together with the photographer and figure out something that we're both happy with, as well as a couple too. If they have an idea for where they want to do this, it's very hard to override and be like, no, we should go under a gazebo or something. Uh, if they want to do boardwalk, we will do boardwalk and we'll figure out a way to make it work the best that we possibly can. And there always is some, something you can do some, some sort of compromise you can make to, to make it as best you can. Four video shots. 
I know that I need as much coverage of the couple as I can possibly get, but I also know that in 10 minutes of golden hour, I can get what we could get in three hours out here in kind of not ideal sun, unless we get a nice cloud, which we were fortunate to get a few of. But I do know that I'm going to get much richer and faster and prettier content in golden hour, or even if we don't get an actual sunset, even just that time of day and that quality of light um, is going to be far superior to what we're doing right now. But I think that it is important for photography. It's nice to get all of the, I guess, the pressure things out of the way. I also find it very difficult as a video person to include much of wedding, full wedding party things. I would much rather pull off small, little, candid shots of them doing something. If, say, they're the wedding party today, I think there's about maybe 12 people in it. And I would way rather pull candid videos of them throughout the day rather than just the line up and smile and face the camera shot and talk to each other and uh, walk in a straight line towards me. That feels a little bit too forced and too directed. Um, I would much rather just get the, the single cutaways and piece that together. As far as uh, the people that I actually take videos of, the thing that I've discovered is that with photography, obviously you take a photo of everybody, they can just skip it in the in the final video. Here's me filming a goose. Um, that they can just skip that photo if it's a photo of a, a plus one or whatever and the, that couple aren't together anymore or it's like a friend or something. Um, when that random individual that they maybe don't know ends up in the w wedding video, it will actually cause them to ask you for a re-edit of the video. So I kind of learned this pretty early on and specifically with hybrid coverage, I'm very tight to the family and the wedding party and that's kind of all that I will put in the video edit as far as um, like kind of a full shot if it's just say a close up like what's happening right here. I would not include a close up like that of a guest, especially if they're wearing a white dress. Always avoid the guests wearing white dresses. Um, it doesn't happen too often, but sometimes it does. But be very conscious of that and know that that could be a potential re-edit that the couple loves the, the entire video and then they see that shot three quarters of the way through and then that's all they think about. They're like, ah, crap, we have to ask for how do we, how do I ask nicely that we love the video, but can we get rid of Steve? We don't want Steve, but we love the rest of the video. And then the other struggle for you as the, the editor, and again, the editing is in the the video and the, the members website, uh, the struggle for you as an editor is now you have to find another clip to replace that with. And if you timed it all out nicely to music, you have to find a clip that roughly kind of goes in that spot. So the less edits you can do, the better, um, as far as re-edits go. And I would say that it's been maybe two years. I don't want to jinx it, but it's been maybe two or three years since I've had even a small request, um, in the wedding video. I will also say that couples are typically wildly happy once they have their wedding video with their photos. So if you are a photographer and you're you're doing hybrid coverage and you just want to do simple highlights for your couples, um, I feel like it is a very, very worthwhile thing. If they are someone that you're talking and you're like, hey, I'll, I'll do a two minute music video style highlight. And they're like, well, can you also capture vows? And can you also capture our full ceremony? And can you also capture speeches and our choreographed first dance and the mother's son dance and three other dances? Um, at that point, I'm very quick to be like, you need to hire like a dedicated video team for this, that th this is beyond what I can do, especially if I'm doing photography as well. Um, and typically with expectations, they would expect a lot more as far as what the final product looks like as well. And to have a full dedicated video team there that with gimbals and maybe, I don't know, I've, I've seen jibs on dance floors before. And to get a full video team in to meet their expectations is better than you trying to just sell your three quarters as good services um, and disappoint them. And if they're going to be upset with the wedding video, they're going to be upset with the photos and they're going to be upset with all the memories of their wedding. And it's a, it's a big deal. So um, always make sure that you have the technical ability to execute what you are saying. And if you have not yet done it, find a way to go and practice prior to the wedding day. And maybe that means working with another video team or offering your services up to a couple of the last minute that does not have a wedding video team. This is me, so this is kind of out of scope of this video. I'm not gonna to talk too much about audio, but basically what I'm doing is I'm capturing their vows. So all they wanted was just vows only, which is really nice. Um, so I'm gonna do a stand, like I'm just gonna stand in the center of the aisle and just capture their vows as they read them. And I am going to put this H5 into Jeff's speaker and I'm gonna to try to make it look as pretty as possible. I It's not so pretty this time. I'm sorry, Jeff. I, I did, I 
made a better situation for next time. I didn't realize how high your speaker went. I thought that I was fine. And uh, the idea is basically that you capture whatever's coming through the microphone and you can sometimes get a board feed if there's no board. Or sometimes, it, like you'll, you, I think it might even been this wedding or maybe uh, another wedding at the same, I'm at the same venues a lot, uh, that I was asking the DJ and he's like, yeah, I can't give you an out from my board that there just was not an option. And he was like, I'm so sorry, man. And then I think I sat down for two minutes and I was like, I bet there's an out on the side of the speaker. And then I went and looked and I just put the quarter inch cable into the, into the speaker and took the out from the speaker and it sounded perfect. So, um, come prepared. There's a lot of audio is very tricky. I think over, especially when you're layering, if you're doing photography coverage and you're doing audio and you're doing video and you're doing a highlight and you're doing a locked off cam, it very quickly becomes enough to hire a full video team for. And if I I would say it's kind of the, the same as getting started in wedding photography or wedding video that by the time you've done like maybe 10 weddings, you've kind of troubleshooted most of the things, but in those first couple weddings, Photography, you show up, you got a few lenses, you got a couple flashes, you're going to be fine. Video, you need some surprise things sometimes. Like yesterday, we had the only ability to get a board out was through an RCA. And fortunately, we had one. But every time, it's like, what year is it? Why, Why do we only have an RCA out? Okay, yeah, sure. We'll make it happen. There's usually a speaker out. And sometimes you just get completely screwed and there's no way for you to get an out. There's a few venues around here that we know that we have to put a lav on. Actually, there's a clip. Um, maybe if, if this is interesting to you, put a note in the comment and I will update with you with this because I'm going to forget I talked about this. But Tim, uh, the guy that I work with a lot, Tim, Timothy Musa on Instagram, uh, he found on Etsy, I think, a little microphone clip. So it's a little recorder that will actually attach to a handheld mic. So the mic that Jeff is holding off to the side there. And if you can't get a board feed, you can't get an out, you can actually record or put a recorder on the actual microphone, just a small little low profile one. And you can actually capture straight from the the mouth of the speaker, which is actually quite incredible. Um, That's also a weird descriptor, but yeah. Here we go. Ceremony. I do my best to get a slightly different shot of everyone, or I know how many. So like based on the scope of today, I know that I'm probably only going to use the best man coming down the aisle and maybe the maid of honor and also flower children or bring bearers if if those exist. And I know I'm going to get those shots. I record all this just as kind of footage to have, but I know that I'm not going to be using all of this. Um, The weird thing, I guess, is if you are shooting single cam that you kind of have to make the shot different. Otherwise, you're going to be slam cutting the same scene with different people walking through and maybe you can do that in a cool way and I can see a few ways to do that cool but it would take editing time and it's also uh when you do something that's heavily stylized you do risk the opportunity that maybe a couple's not going to be as stoked as it on you that's not even close to english that they might not be as as excited about it as you are and i think as a wedding video creator at least from my eyes again i'm not the all saying person on wedding video (laughs) hey jeff uh is that to do a linear edit with straight cuts, nothing exciting going on. You're going to watch that video 10, 20, 30, 40 years from now, and it's still going to look good. If you're doing too many, like, I don't know, zooms, transitions and whatnot, it's just, it risks it not looking that great years down the road. And the simpler you can keep it, in my opinion, the better. I also do a straight linear timeline. I'm not bouncing around. I'm not launching from a speech into vows into the ceremony into getting ready and then guys getting ready and then a day after shoot and then back to the wedding and ceremony and first kiss and closing with um, someone else's speech. I'm not doing anything like that. It's very simple, straightforward editing. And I think that that is the way that it's going to keep it the, um, the most future proof as far as people just watching their wedding video and being like, wow, yeah, spot color. That was a thing at that time. Hmm. I wonder if we can ask for a different version and it's been 20 years and there's no way that they're going to get a re-edit of it at that point. Maybe to speak briefly about that, I back everything up on the line so that I have an offsite backup. I do that the night of the wedding. And as soon as I sit down, I load all my cards in and I start that backup. And it is a backup that I still have from the beginning of my career. So I don't delete anything. I just keep it all. And 
maybe it was easier because I was shooting 1080 60 maybe send some proxies to the to the cloud and keep those because it'll be a little bit less expensive but I think it is very important to keep all of your content for your wedding couples um, on the photography side of things I still get edit requests every now and then or just that people lost their photos from uh, 2007 even and I had to do that uh, two weeks ago I was like ah. Eh. I'll find it if you got, <laughs> I don't even remember what I charged. I was like, if you send me a hundred bucks, I'll do it right now. And, uh, they were like, yeah, no problem. <laughs> and I went through and I dug the hard drive out and it took me maybe about an hour to find it. And I had to do a re-edit to some of the images cause I, I saved the raw files, but I didn't save the back or the final gallery. Um, but I sent it to them and it's nice to be able to do that. And it's, I don't know, like if I wouldn't have had that, it would have been the most awkward. I would have felt like a complete failure that yes, sorry, I just, don't have it. I guess the, the drive's gone. Um, so always keep your backups. Keep it physically somewhere on a drive. But if it's a spinny drive, drives are physical, mechanical things, and they will fail eventually. So keep it also on a cloud. And again, those backups of backups of backups. And I don't know, stress yourself out less later. I am on the 7200 right now with the Peter McKinnon ND still on here. And I'm doing my best to get some reaction shots of families, of the couple of basically the less time I can spend up here. I know that this is kind of prime time that we have a cloud and I'm very, very thankful for that. So I'm going to do as many shots as I can. And I know the ones that are going to make the final video a shot like that's going to make the final video, a shot of a random guest, probably not going to make a video a shot of a random guest, not even smiling for sure. Not going to make the video. So why even shoot it a shot like this? We'll make the video. You can crop in on that. You can do whatever you want to it. If it's too similar, um, I try to get the speaker out of the background as best I can there, but it that's kind of as good as I could. I, it wasn't really just popping out of the directly behind a single person's head. Um, so I think it's fine. And yeah, again, all these shots will for sure make the video. And I know that because the video is done and they made the, the video. I'm running the Rode VideoMic Pro, uh, not the Pro Plus, just a regular Pro that takes a nine volt battery. Um, I have that just as a backup audio source again, backups of backups of backups. So I have, uh, well, I have a lav on Jeff, so I have uh, audio on the officiant. And then knowing that maybe he's gonna sneak away whenever they do their vows, I have the board feed and I have this road as a backup. Um, you can also talk to the officiant before, you can lav the groom if you want. I don't recommend laving a wedding dress. Um, and by lav, I mean, lavalier microphone, just a little um, tiny recorder. We use, um, again, in the courses over on the members website, there's kind of full breakdown, but we just use these little small um, recorders that we can kind of put in any inside pocket to put that on a bride's dress. I don't really recommend it. And also you don't really have to, I don't think. Um, it would be a bit of a, it's an invasion of space, I think. So uh, to just maybe lav a groom or to do the, the officiant is a much simpler solution for that. 7200 really coming in very crucial for doing this section of the day. Uh, for rings, it's always such a hard, you can even talk to your couples before, but they'll still usually forget once they're up there. The Whoever's on the, the right hand side, you usually can get a shot of them putting their ring on. I feel like it's also not necessarily a requirement to get a great shot of both of those that it's kind of it's a bit of a weird moment just to see full screen hands so you can get one of those shots and then cut to something a little bit wider and then um, eventually cut to the first kiss and this is um, them signing the register and us being uh, serenaded from a lovely song here that you I, I don't know how to license her song I could probably play it it'd probably be fine but I don't want to steal her steal her art and again, there's those those moments you know aren't going to make the video. In Canada, we sign the marriage license as part of the ceremony. Uh, I think in most of Europe, maybe you do as well. I don't know. I have I have done many weddings over that way. Uh, but basically, I know it's not going to end up in the video. So if I can get reaction shots of other people, uh, if they're laughing, smiling, talking to each other, I know those will make the video more than the couple signing the marriage license. But at the same time just as a kind of a backup i like to be i like to have that footage in case they ever randomly request it which i'm sure they won't but if they ever did it would be nice to have that to put back into the edit first kiss i usually just literally stand there and i do my best to get two shots from it if i'm doing video i want a closer shot is usually what i start with because typically jeff's quick he gets out of the way but most efficients like awkwardly linger and if it's a fast first kiss they're usually in the video which is very annoying so i usually start very tight and then I go wide 
And typically couples will actually do two kisses um, or a hug or something after. And I'll usually include both of those. And I want them to look different because, again, you can't slam cut from the same frame to them doing a different thing in the same frame. And I'm still on my 7200 and they came down the aisle quick. So I'm doing the best I can to at least get one shot. And it, I do like it's uh, with fortunately with camera tracking autofocus, it's so easy now. Uh, to do a highlight film, I've been doing them probably since 2013, 12, maybe, maybe 2010. And a long time ago, back back in my day, walking uphill both ways to weddings, it was so much more difficult to make a good highlight film, especially if you're also doing photography coverage. Now you can kind of just get a nice lens, point to camera. I'm getting transition shots of people's feet there point to the camera in their direction and you're probably going to get a pretty nice shot. Not that there isn't art or skill involved in actually doing this, but it is a heck of a lot easier now. And these are the final, again, ungraded clips and roughly kind of what's going to end up in the wedding film. Always get the reaction shot of whoever's standing at the front. If someone is standing at the front, looking back down at their partner coming down, um, get those quick shots that are nice and close and then kind of get out of the way if you can. I don't love to be up in the, the center of attention, so I get the shots when they first arrive. Usually there's a lot of excitement and energy, and also in this case, a cloud for good light. So I get all those shots and I just leave and go to the back as fast as I possibly can. And also 7200 really makes my life so much easier here. I don't think that I need something super wide. I don't need to get the full scene. There's construction, there's different things going on that I don't necessarily want. And by having a 7200 again, I'm kind of simplifying. Here we go, taking off the ND, doing a few detail shots. Um, I'll fix that white balance, <laughs> that's for sure. A little, little warm in there. And I don't usually include too many details. Again, I'm getting the coverage just in case maybe either I need it, I need to stretch something, or if a couple ever requests like, hey, can you add a few shots? I don't think that they ever would, but it, I would rather have those shots than not have them. Um, as far as what I actually include in the, the final highlight, it's usually maybe three shots as a transition. So typically a wider shot of the room, followed by maybe a detail, followed by maybe something with their name on it, or maybe their place card or something like that. Um, and then I will typically shoot the wide shot on the 35. So the 35 is my second camera that you haven't really seen a whole lot in the wedding. I should tuck my shirt in. But my 35 is, I would say, it, it's used not even 5% of the time, but it is better for details overall. Um, so yeah, just something to have uh, also in the backups of backups of backups, have a second camera as a backup as well in case it goes down. Wow. So this is, so that's nice to know. I hadn't, I hadn't watched all this footage back, but that's when my stabilization clearly turned off. And prior to that, and starting now. So it was only really off for one shot. That's not, that's not so bad. I was nervous it was off for the whole ceremony and I was gonna have to warp stabilize absolutely everything. For musicians, unless they are friends with the band or friends with the, the couple, I am just getting hands doing things, strings moving, bows, whatever it might be. Um, I typically get a wide shot of everyone in case it turns out that they're best friends from high school or something, but typically what goes in the highlight is something like what you're seeing in the bottom left. Intros. I don't know how much of this, I feel like it's maybe a short clip of that. I find that whenever I work with proper video teams, they go real hard on the intros and the intros look really amazing. They're on the glide cams or whatever, steady cam, and they do something very nice gimbal wise. I feel like handheld, maybe this is one of the parts that it just isn't quite as good as what it could be with moving camera. But I know in terms of my edit, I'm going to use the couple coming in and usually they're a little bit slower than everyone else because there's usually a larger dress involved. And I do my best to kind of get one clean shot of them entering the room. And then typically I will also suggest that if they aren't opposed to doing their first dance upon entering the room, it is nicer lighting usually for uh for first dances at that point. Uh, I'm also fine if they do it after dinner. It's just when it's in that awkward kind of blue hour-y period. I, I don't love to bring out additional lighting for wedding days. I use a Stella Pro Reflex light um, if I actually am lighting anything, but I would much rather not have to light anything and just work with the ambient light that's happening in the room and use it in the best way possible. Here we go, short clip. That's all I need, a little dance. And now I can cut to the actual reception. 
mirrorless cameras. <laughs> this would, I, I don't know if I would have posted all of my footage prior to shooting mirrorless where everything's just easily most, mostly in focus. There's been a few fails, but overall I would say it's, it's pretty spot on. I would say Canon, Sony, uh, Nikon as well with the, the Z9 specifically all make your life very, very, very easy. And I will definitely say that the quality of my final edits has gone up quite a lot, maybe not quite a lot, but like at least 20% as far as just the fact that pretty much every clip is usable except for sometimes you're on the wrong side of a thing. So I should have been where Lindsay was. Lindsay got that shot. But then also I, I would rather have guests in the background than the band. I got the sh shots of the band to show that there's a live band. And I didn't necessarily need to, to have them in the background of all the first dance shots. So maybe I did choose frame direction correctly. They just, um, their choreographed dance was um, set up to have a center line of somewhere else. Is that the right term? I don't know my choreographed dance terminology. For speeches... Typically at some point here when the light gets a little bit lower, I will move from a 7200 to an 85. Uh, however, this room, the layout is kind of hard. So I think I stay on my 7200 for most of the reception just because of where the podium is placed and the fact that the parents are directly in front of me standing there. And um, I can kind of get this shot, but I don't really want to stand directly in front of the parents uh, during speeches. And I can also, I would say maybe the, the easy shot is that if you stand at the end of the head table, which again, I'd be standing in front of tables, but less important tables, um, and end of head table, I mean the far side where the band was set up, that usually whoever's at the podium will be looking at the couple sitting at the table and you can get eye line a lot faster. Um, another tip for whether you're doing photo or video is to get, as soon as somebody gets up to the podium, most of their happy, funny, laughing energy is going to come out within the first like eight seconds. And then they're going to potentially go into just straight up reading a speech. or they're going to read an iPad and the light's going to be terrible. And it's going to be glowing on their face and it's going to be bad. So do everything you can to be there for the first couple of seconds of their speech. And also, I don't know, the color's not that bad, but maybe I feel like one of the benefits of the LUT, not to talk too much about how, how great and lovely it is. I'm not a professional LUT designer. Um, I just made one that, or I made a bunch that I like because I shoot this profile. Maybe that's something we haven't even talked about yet that I don't shoot uh, any sort of log profile. I just shoot this built in look. And, I, and my LUTs uh, work with that. So if you're shooting kind of just a built in regular color profile like this, um, they'll work very well. But with that LUT, and it's the same with my photography and my presets as well, that when you apply it, it takes a lot of that kind of orange away and it balances something pretty close to what you would color correct to. And that was completely intentional because I do shoot pretty much until it is proper incandescent inside. I will stay on shade white balance. If there's still light coming in from the, from the windows, I will stay on shade white balance. And my reasoning for not doing any sort of log format for my footage is simply to save time that I realized that like what this is again, like what you're seeing is straight at a camera and it's pretty close to what I would want as a final image. So why shoot it in log to maybe get a few extra pieces of dynamic range when I'm very, very, very happy with exactly how this looks right now. There are exceptions and I will shoot log when it basically when dynamic range scenes are just almost impossible. Uh, there is a wedding or will be a wedding on the channel, uh, a wedding that actually got published in people magazine and Blair shot all of that in log because the ceremony was so weirdly lit that it was an absolute requirement to, if you're working with easier light, you don't really have to do a whole lot to it. Um, it's much easier. I think to shoot built in color profile again, maybe this is going to anger all the people that it angered with the ND section as well. But um, it's just kind of what I've been doing, and I've been very, very happy with it. And I don't know, skin tones, those look great. I know it's just hands. It's a very long. That was what I was waiting for. Again, I'm waiting for that motion. I don't need them holding hands. I need them joining hands or releasing hands. I wonder if, if I reverse the footage of them releasing hands, if I could make them hold hands, which is a heck of a lot more romantic. I'll investigate that after this video. Got a nice little pop of light, not really a sunset, but we did get some warm golden light. And at this point, I think I went up in white balance. So I'm usually on the cloud mode and I went to proper shade, which is more, it's usually a house with some lines. And that was getting me kind of a more correct skin tone. And again, that's just the color profile as built into the camera. Got our cheerleading section over there. And 7200, again, 
I could go wider if I want wider. I get that crane in the shot. I get those flower pots that are not wedding colors. And um, it's just better to stay tighter. It's cleaner, it keeps it more simple. And I think it makes for a better video overall. Now I'm gonna to switch to my Samyang 85 because I love the sun flare from it. As you can see, it is very different. The, the Canon 70 to 200 controls it very well. The Samyang kind of lets that sun creep in a little bit and I like it a lot to be honest. Um, so that's why I chose that decision. I also love shooting at 1.4. It's just soft and pretty and very wetting. And I asked them for kind of this shot here cause I knew that I, I, I was 80% confident with what I got, but I knew just one shot like that would definitely make the film and would definitely be in kind of the closing section. Um, close the film as strong as you can. So usually what that means is that everything is linear and then maybe after the first dance, you cut to a sunset session to finish the wedding film off. Um, I feel like that's kind of the way that uh, videos feel the best, that you open with something strong. Um, the, the cliche is to open with a drone shot, and then you close with something strong as well, so that the last memory that they have of the video is something that they looked really good in, they're really happy and in love and whatnot. So usually, sunset session is the, uh, the time that that comes out the most. All right, to run through the footage that we got, <laughs> it's a very boring cut to a wide shot of the ceremony room. A few musicians playing some instruments and eventually cutting into, again, not color graded, uh, first dances and everything else that happened in the reception. Do my best to say at one slash one twenty fifth of a second. And I think I successfully did that with no problem whatsoever here. Um, when things get darker, it's a lot easier to maintain those shutter speeds. So I did observe the 180 shutter rule today was usually I do not. You could also bring in a light to light up the podium a little bit better, but I do feel like it becomes uh, a little bit too much of a production for, for my couples that if I were to ask them, like, is that something that you'd want? They would maybe reluctantly agree and be like, if it's what you need, yeah, okay. Um, but it's definitely not something that they would love to absolutely have there. I feel like it also makes people a little bit more nervous if you do light the podium. Uh, I will if it's absolutely necessary. I would say this podium here, good enough, but I did have to clean it up a little bit in post-production for color. Here we go, a few ending shots, and this will all edit together very, very nicely with some lovely, lovely music. There you have it. Hope you enjoyed. And there was a lot in there. Uh, there's, a, yeah, that was a much longer video than I intended it to be. Uh, I want to say thanks for, for sticking with it. And I hope that this has brought some clarity to video production. Uh, I think that it is so important for you as a photographer, if you are a photographer watching this, to learn a little bit of video production, uh, whether that is for the commercial side of your business or it's actually for wedding days, you will find so many more job opportunities open up when you can do video. Uh, I have found that I'm going to say, it's been a minute, it's been multiple years since I've done a commercial job that has been only photography only. Uh, maybe one exception was the, I did a job for Red Bull that was very specific to just photo, but every other job other than that has always been a photo video job for me. And you can really set yourself apart from the rest of the people that you're competing against if you can do both in-house, that if somebody's doing a set, they're, they're setting something up, they need photography of that, if you can also roll video on it, it makes so much more sense rather than bringing in two teams and coordinating two schedules. If you can just kind of do everything yourself with a second, it makes a customer's life, a client's life, a, a couple's life, so much easier. So something to think about. Also, I'll kind of leave you with a, a bigger note on this. And this is something that we're going to continue to explore over the summer because I have a wedding coming up that has actually requested this. And it is the fact that video is becoming, obviously every social media platform is very video first right now. And as people that are kind of growing up in that platform uh, become aged to get married, all of a sudden you're probably gonna be noticing a lot more demand on video because that's just how people are used to experiencing life and, and their friends and they want video. I got one uh, yesterday actually that we shot that was pretty much they wanted just video. They hired us for photography and then they were like, but like we really like video, can you, can you do that instead? And they wanted family photos, they wanted couples photos and I did a few of kind of the dress and a couple flat lays and other than that, it was just video coverage for the day. It felt very, very weird. And I don't know if this is where the industry is kind of heading in the future or if this is just kind of a one-off experience, but it definitely is something that I kind of maybe, I don't want to say I predicted it, but I guess I kind of did. Talked about it a lot that that would kind of be my dream to go in as far as the client deliverable. It's 
it's kind of the, the ideal piece that you walk away with an amazing video that you can watch anytime. You're not gonna get a full wedding album, but you're gonna get the, the images to put up on the wall. Maybe it's not a package for everyone, but it definitely is something that is going to become increasingly more in demand over time. If you have any questions, feel free to drop them in the comments and I will get back to you as best I can. And if you are interested and it is before July 14th, 2022, you can get in on the members website. You get the full length courses and everything for $30 per month rather than 40 at July 14th, midnight Eastern time. It goes back up to 40. And again, 30 day money back guarantee. You join, it wasn't what you were expecting. Send me an email within 30 days and I will send you your money back. That's all for today. Thank you for being here. Don't forget to subscribe if you haven't subscribed and I'll see you again next time.